So this week on the podcast, we had Gian Claudio Malgieri, an associate professor of law and technology at the Ed Heck Business School in Lille, France. He recently wrote an excellent paper entitled Algorithmic Impact Assessments Under the GDPR Producing Multilayered Explanations. And that caught my attention. He's also written a number of other articles in algorithmic decision making, AI under GDPR, and federated learning. So as I've said before on this podcast, the EU probably has the most comprehensive regulatory construct for privacy law in the world. It's undeniably a model, although not necessarily the model, uh, for countries contemplating privacy policy and regulation. Now, the capabilities of algorithms processing personal information continues to get more sophisticated, and it's logical for private and public entities to become more reliant on it. The challenge is that when they use personal data to generate decisions that are at odds with privacy rights, public policy or regulation, how would we, public policymakers, et cetera, know? The more sophisticated the algorithms become, the more challenging it's going to be to try to reverse engineer or determine after the fact what it was doing. Even the creators of algorithms have not contemplated all the impacts. Understanding these impacts can have a multitude of benefits, including better algorithms and more aligned impacts. Of course, if it, like anything, regulation can be a blunt tool with its own costs and impacts, so it's a careful balancing act. Whether you believe more regulation or less regulation is needed or none, um, you're going to find this episode fascinating. Uh, but to take it a step further, and this is something I raised in an earlier episode with Diane Heward Mills about deploying best practice, such as a assessment of impacts in creating or deploying algorithms and changes to them later, makes sense at a business level as well as at a policy level. No one wants biases in the outcomes of their algorithms. And if you're not periodically assessing for those biases, particularly when you're making changes, the decisions you make from those algorithms will be flawed. On the flip side, of course, that there is a risk that if you require certain frameworks by regulation that might lead to the bureaucratization of them and possibly become a CYA or check the box exercise. So again, a careful balancing act. Hope you enjoy this episode. Um, and I also hope that if you really enjoyed it or other episodes that you're sharing it, that you're finding one person to share this and say, hey, check out this, uh, this podcast. I like what I'm hearing. Welcome to The Encrypted Economy, a weekly podcast featuring discussions exploring the business, laws, regulation, security, and technologies relating to digital assets and data. I am Eric Hess, founder of Hess Legal Counsel. I have spent decades representing regulated exchanges, broker-dealers, investment advisors, and all matter of fintech companies for all things touching electronic trading with a focus on new and developing technologies. Today, we're fortunate to have Gian Claudio Mal Malgieri uh, on the podcast. He is an associate professor of law and technology at EdHEC uh, Business School in France. He is the co-director of the Brussels Privacy Hub. He is a ethics expert for the uh, European Commission. Uh, he also, and he, he can... He can correct me if I'm off on this. <laughs> he conducts research on and teaches data protection, uh, law, privacy, AI regulation, digital law, consumer protection in the digital market, data sustainability, and intellectual property law. He's got, he's got quite the full plate there. Uh, Gian Claudio, welcome. Thank you very much, Eric. And thank you very much for having me here. I'm very happy to be here. So I, I gave a little bit on your background, but do you want to kind of give us maybe a, a little bit more on your path to get here, your interest specifically in, um, you know, the GDPR and algorithmic, uh, you know, both AI and algorithmic uh, issues raised uh, by the GDPR? Yeah, sure. Um, let's say that um, um, doing research on GDPR was quite amazing and exciting in the last, uh, let's say, five, ten years in the European Union. It was quite an obliged choice because uh, when I started to, to, to dig into tech law, cyber law, and so on, the discussion was totally monopolized by data protection. And uh, I started to get fun about data protection to, to understand it more and more. And then, um, yeah, basically, um, I've come across um, uh, automated decision making as the real new topic, new buzzword. Everyone was talking about explanation of AI, right? So I think that in the last years, uh, the most interesting part of my research, the most 
let's say for me, the most interesting parts were uh, intersectoral and interdisciplinary uh, research with computer scientists, psychologists, marketing scholars, because I think that lawyers need to talk with others, with other people. We usually tend to be, you know, in our room. We need to be with other people and we need to to talk different languages, right? So yes, so in my last years, I had the fortune to to have this uh, discussion about uh, explanation of AI, um, vulnerability. Uh, my, most, my, my, my biggest uh, topic of research in the last years was uh, vulnerable data subjects in uh, Europe and beyond. And um, uh, so mostly uh, fairness, fairness of AI, you know, general concepts. And uh, from, I mean, it's a few months that I've been appointed co-director of the Brussels Privacy Hub, where we try to elucidate these concepts, new policy proposals in Europe and beyond. Uh, we try to be uh, a reference for uh, researchers, policymakers, uh, and uh, lawyers. So yes, mm, that's all. <laughs> Um, and and before we sort of kick into it, um, do you have like a personal experience uh, that uh, maybe when you you know really focused your attention on what you're focusing on now? Meaning like some personal experience where it all clicked, something early on uh, which you can sort of think back to. What, what would that be? Well, yes, I have some of them. Um, some are more personal and other are more professional um, experiences that uh, imposed me to study these topics. Uh, let's say <clears throat> um, a couple of uh, general experiences that I can talk about is, uh, uh, first of all, the selection of students. Uh, I am a professor in France where there is an algorithm that uh, uh, decides which uh, kind of students can be in uh, some high level universities. So there's, uh, uh, and there was uh, an automated process some years ago called Parcoursup uh, that uh, through AI could decide uh, what students could be accepted in a high level school. And for me, this was the first motivation to study justification and explanation of AI. Uh, smaller examples are uh, some colleagues at the university that were trying to have smaller uh, loans for uh, buying a new computer and so on, and they just received a no. <laughs> so also the explanation of decisions was something that really motivated me. And my research about vulnerable people in AI, I think, was driven by a couple of uh, personal experience. First of all, being member of LGBT community was a big, uh, uh, let's say. <clears throat> stimulus for my research on vulnerability. So yes, I think my research was very much influenced by my personal experience as for everyone, I guess. Great. I read your paper on algorithmic impact assessments, um, and we're going to drop it into the show notes. It's something that I hope that we can talk more about today in, in addition to some other uh, 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 events related to GDPR. But um, do, do you want to kind of give a little bit of a backdrop for the paper? Yeah, sure. I think in the GDPR, one of the biggest um, innovations and revolutions was the, I mean, two of them. One that had a lot of attention was uh, uh, how to address automated decision making. So how we should regulate automated decisions, so algorithms that take decisions, and how we can protect people that receive strong impacts that have strong impacts on the basis of these automated decisions. The second great novelty of the GDPR was the impact assessment, data protection impact assessment. In the US, there's the environmental impact assessment, and the European one was a bit built on the example of the environmental impact assessment. With my co-author, Professor Margot Kaminski, uh, she's a professor in Colorado Law School, um, we had the idea that these two tools, so regulation of automated decisions and data protection impact assessment, had to talk, had to be connected. And uh, this was essential for two reasons. First, it is good for customers, consumers, individuals, because it helps to reach better decisions and better explanations of decisions. Secondly, 
it helps data controllers, companies, because they really have these two duties. Protect people when there are automated decisions and do an impact assessment. If we manage to propose a model that can combine these two tools, it would be win-win for companies and for individuals. So that's why we had the idea to write this paper uh, that had quite fortune so far. So, yes. Excellent. And and maybe as a, a bit of a precursor to that, um, maybe you could review the evolution of GDPR regulation around uh, the issue of algorithms processing uh, personal data. Protected. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. So basically, um, in the GDPR, we have um, um, Article 22 about uh, right not to be subject to automated decisions, right? So basically, when there is an algorithm that uh, takes a decision on individuals, and when this decision has a, a legal or similarly significant impact, effect. So for example, um, uh, a denial of a bank, uh, of, of a request to a bank, or um, um, accessing to a particular school or university, uh, whatever. There are many examples that we can, that we can make. Well, in this cases, we have a right not to be subject to this decision unless we give explicit consent or there is a member state law that authorizes this. So, for example, uh, I don't know, in Germany, it is authorized uh, that uh, uh, some algorithms can take decisions about insurance. Uh, so it depends on the, on the national law. And the third one, um, is uh, uh, so basically you have so I said consent, uh, member state law or necessary for a contract. So the third one is contract hmm? when the, when it's necessary for a contract in which I am a party. Okay, well uh, in these cases there are additional safeguards that I should have as a customer. Right, first is to receive ex information in general about the algorithm. So we should understand how the AI works. Hmm? Secondly, uh, we should uh, uh, be able to contest the algorithm, to contest the decision. Thirdly, we have a right to have a human in the loop. So we have a right to have a human that can change or approve the machine decision. And the last uh, thing is the, the right to say my own opinion in the uh, in the automated decisions. In addition to this, for higher risks, so for data processing involving higher risk, for example, uh, when there is high, high uh, large amount of sensitive data, huh? hospitals, uh, dating apps, and so on, I have also right to receive specific explanation of the decisions about me. So you see, it's it's really a risk based approach with some safeguards, right? So this is basically how the GDPR protects individuals that receive automated decisions. Right, and and there are other jurisdictions that have uh, similar protections. Like, for example, the Canadian government has, uh, I think, they have an online algorithmic impact tool, uh, which is actually I, I looked up quite interesting. Uh, State-run agencies and departments are required to perform <laughs> these. Um, but uh, uh, you know, what other jurisdictions have something that that even closely, you know, resembles GDPR? Well, um, the last part that maybe I had to uh, clarify for, to the last answer was that an additional point is also auditing of algorithms. This is also part of the GDPR, auditing algorithm through a risk assessment. And this is the link between the impact assessment and automated decision making uh, rights and safeguards. If we can apply this model, so ha make, having uh, um, analyzing the impact of algorithms uh, and use this analysis as an explanation to individuals so what is happening this was the real core of our article uh, we can have the win-win uh, situation I was explaining before so we have other 
countries and jurisdictions where some forms of uh, auditing of algorithms and algorithmic impact assessment is already a reality. You mentioned Canada, of course, they have a directive about algorithmic impact assessment and how they do that. Just, yeah, we can say public authorities are forced, I mean, are asked to do this impact assessment of algorithms, uh, but they, they, they are I mean, there are some easy ways to do that. There is a software in which they can uh, um, self-assess their algorithms. This is what is missing in Europe. We have wonderful principle-based law, but we miss sometimes some automated form of compliance or, let's say, facilitated form of compliance, right? So, of course, we have Canada that has this example. It's a, a symbol to, to do a, a algorithmic impact assessment in Canada, but it's a bit a superficial approach because you cannot really go deeper and deeper huh? because it's just a general software used for all um, public offices. Then we have other examples around the world, right? We have the Brazilian data protection uh, law uh, that also has uh, the right to receive explanation of algorithms. Um, um, and then we have, uh, uh, even in China, huh? it was just approved a few uh, few weeks ago, it was the beginning of November, that uh, the Chinese, uh, uh, dr- I mean, uh, algorithmic bill uh, was approved, in which basically individuals have a right also to understand the logic and the functioning of uh, algorithms. And also, you know, uh, th- there should be some form of risk assessment all around uh, th- these jurisdictions. So, yes, we have other existing examples. In the US, it was just a proposal. We have the Biden proposal, uh, sorry, the Biden proposal <laughs> um, was uh, a proposal about algorithmic uh, impact assessment. So automated decision making impact assessment. So some uh, assessing the impact of automated decisions. Uh, it was the first proposal of uh, 2018. Then it was reproposed in the new Congress, and it's still pending. I'm not very optimistic, but I'm not, uh, you know, a specialist of U.S. law. And then, uh, yes, basically, these are the the most, I mean, interesting uh, existing uh, laws about um, about explanations of AI and uh, impact assessment. Yes. Right. In the Widen uh, account, uh, Algorithmic Accountability Act, um, mm-hmm. that applies to entities that use, store, or share personal information uh, to conduct automated decision system uh, impact assessments and data protection impact assessments. Uh, I agree. I don't think it's going to be a 2022, <laughs> probably not a 2023. Uh, but, it, you know, there, I think there's some other wood to chop in the U.S. before we, we get to that. But, uh, and in China, is the China one is law, but does it only apply to private entities? Entities, or does it also apply to governmental entities? Yeah, it, it applies mostly to it applies to private entities actually. So yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's <laughs> the other it's the other side of the moon. If we consider Canada, that applies to also to, only to public uh, entities, right? It's the, the the fear of big brother, and in China you have just the problem of small brothers. So yeah, basically yeah. you have these two different. <laughs> approaches. If if I can add something in the U.S., I forgot to mention that some states have legislations about uh, out, um, impact assessment of algorithms and so on. So basically, uh, California. California, Virginia. So we have some existing uh, uh, proposals or legislation. So yes, I think something is coming soon, right? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, it, it's going to be difficult for to, to play hopscotch with all the states in the U.S., which ones do and which ones don't after a point. Um, and is, is the problem with the current construct is that it's maybe a little too simplistic in terms of the just offering individual explanations? The problem of uh, um, automated decisions and their explanations is that if uh, companies have a duty to explain the logic of complex algorithms, of uh, black box algorithms, uh, well, um, there might be a very uh, limited approach in complying with these duties, right? So basically what can happen is that companies might easily uh, go with naive form of explanation. So I can make an example. If you if you go on Google ads, so you receive banners everywhere, right? Banners on Facebook, banners on behavioral advertising everywhere, right? And then we can click why this ad? Uh, it happens. Google has as an automated button for that. And usually the reply we receive is 
Because in this time of today and in your country, in your region, in your area, this is um, an interesting content to share. Well, of course, this is not a satisfactory explanation. Huh? Or we can make also other examples. Um, banks, our bank uh, takes decisions based on algorithm. And if we go on the general privacy policy of our bank, what we receive is just uh, some naive <laughs> explanation saying sometimes we receive, we, we do some form of automated decisions to help us and to, 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 um, to make our process quicker. Of course, this is not enough, right? So what we really need is to find the balance between uh, effectiveness, so comprehensibility uh, of explanations, uh, but also uh, detail, the level of granularity. So uh, of course, there should be different explanations for different audiences, right? So we should have uh, more um, specific explanations and not so easy and sober explanation for experts. Our doctors using algorithms when they do the triage or when they treat COVID symptoms and whatever, um, or when they do surgery and so on. But there should be at the same time some uh, simpler explanations where the balancing between uh, uh, simplicity, effectiveness, and um, let's say completeness is more towards simplicity, of course, right? So there are different audiences and different uh, kinds of uh, simplicity, we can say. But maybe what we really need is not just a mere explanation, we need a justification. We need to understand why the algorithm is fair, accurate, right? Limited to what was necessary and not beyond that, and so on. So. Yeah, explanation is okay with the different audiences, but justification is even more important. <laughs> Great. And and with regards to encryption, uh, how does encryption fit into this? Does it actually complicate the uh, the ability to make these explanations? Well, this is a, this is a very nice point because uh, last year we conducted a, 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 an event series in Brussels. It was called uh, Tech Talks, and basically uh, this was a common problem because encryption is a privacy enhancing technology, right? But at the same time, sometimes. Uh, the decisions behind this privacy enhancing technology is difficult to understand for users, right? So you have like a, a paradox um, that using more privacy-friendly uh, technologies means uh, um, black boxes for individuals, so more difficult systems to understand. So again, we should find uh, the good balancing between protection and so the, you know, effectiveness of encryption, for example, and at the same time, uh, uh, level of explanations of these, uh, of these systems. Uh, there, there are many examples we can do. For example, secure multi-party computing or computation is a, is a real good example in which algorithms can be used through a PET, privacy and ANSI technology, but at the same time, um, uh, average individuals could not understand how this is protective or not. And this is uh, a concern of big techs, because big tech, if they invest money in encryption, they also want that individuals feel safer and protected. So they also want to use privacy and ANSI technology as a marketing tool. And if it's difficult to explain, it's difficult to use it to, to leverage, right? This, uh, this, this technologies. So yes, this is a very important point, and I think uh, it's uh, in the future. We'll, this discussion will be more and more important. Now it's just coming. I think in the future we will discuss more and more this. I, I am sure of it. I, I have no answers now, but I have, uh, you know, I agree with the question. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I imagine that uh, something uh, like homomorphic encryption is probably even more challenging than secure multi-party computation just because, you know, of the complexity and the fact that, like, everything's encrypted and we're at least in secure multi-party computation, you know, it, it you know, it, it preserves your data set, but it doesn't necessarily limit you the same way that homomorphically it, it could, since everything is encrypted, very hard to get behind the, the, um, the algorithm. So, um, yeah. 
Can you can you explain the the concept of collaborative governance and and how it fits into GDPR and uh, you, you know your proposal around uh, algorith- algorithmic impact assessments? Yeah, that was one of the concepts that in the paper were the most uh, let's say legal ones. So basically, uh, collaborative governance. Um, it's an ambiguous term, right? Because in the US, it has a meaning. In Europe and in the European Union, it has another meaning. Let's say that in general, we can say that collaborative governance is when it's not just the regulator to control and check the respect of the law, the compliance with the law. And it's not even just the, the single company that needs to bear the uh, costs and the burden of all compliance. Uh, there's a cooperation between the regulator, the watchdog, the um, um, survey, um, let's say oversight authorities, and the companies. So in the GDPR, collaborative governance, for example, is quite evident in the data protection impact assessment. Why? Because the concept of accountability in the GDPR is basically based on the notion of companies that doing their self-assessment, but their self-assessment should be prudent and wise enough because the, the regulator could always check if they respected the minimum threshold, the minimum level. So it's a form of mutual trust between companies and state cooperation. There are even uh, more advanced forms of cooperation that we can mention, even beyond the paper. For example, um, uh, regulatory sandboxes, where basically it's the state that makes an agreement with uh, companies of certain sectors, for example, big tech, social media, or banks, whatever, and and decides some uh, uh, derogations from the written law uh, in order to achieve a better level of uh, governance, compliance, enforcement. The state sometimes cannot check all data processing and the respect of all data protection principles, right? So they have to delegate to the private party some form of self-assessment. And of course, it's easier for them to check a self-assessment than starting from zero, right? And check everything. So this is a bit the idea of collaborative governance. Great. And and in terms of what would need to occur in order for uh, an algorithmic impact assessment to be, I guess, required uh, under GDPR, is there any existing guidance or rulemaking which, uh, you know, it, it could be implied or would it need some more formal guidance or would it need something more? <clears throat> well, according to us, uh, so according to my co-author and me, um, we uh, we already have uh, an algorithmic impact assessment in the law because basically um, data protection impact assessment should be performed in cases of high risk data processing activities. And among the three cases of uh, high risk data processing activities, there's always profiling and automated decision making. It's one of the three. So in these cases, you have to do an impact assessment. What we suggest is that since in cases of automated decisions, companies also need to give explanations, contestation, uh, possibility to have human in the loop, etc., it would be wise to combine these two duties. So to combine an impact assessment with um, these requirements about automated decisions. So in our view, it's not. Uh, a proposal for a reform. It's just a way to better uh, understand and interpret what's already there. And uh, the the benefits are for all parties, as I already said, right? Because the benefits are for companies and the benefits are for um, um, individuals, because individuals would would have a better picture and the companies would uh, would have an easier life. Of course, there are some problems in this. I cannot say that it's all uh, good. Uh, the problems are, for example, trade secrets, and uh, you know, um, companies would not like to share 
impact assessment reports to all customers because they're not obliged to. We have some guidelines, the guidelines uh, interpreting the uh, data protection impact assessment rules uh, require that uh, just some summaries are shared. It's not even mandatory. It's a best practice. So this is the thing maybe in which we should work more in the future. So make the impact assessment reports more available to users. And this is something that is still missing in the law. So we, we, what we say, it's it would be wise to do that. It would be better because it would be a better form of compliance and also better rights for individuals, better forms of safeguards for individuals. But at the same time, uh, companies are still free to have a very limited approach to the existing rules. And the limited approach is not against the law. It's just a limited approach. <laughs> Right. And, and it occurred to me that, you know, the algorithmic impact assessment is probably less about privacy rights per se, although it does impact personal information and probably more about outcomes. Is that a, a, mm -hmm. a way of looking at it? Like a personal outcome, uh, something that impacts your personal rights or yeah. or impacts you yeah. personally that you're not otherwise privy to versus, you know, my my information was uh, disclosed. Um, yeah. So yeah. uh, in in you yep sorry <laughs> <laughs> no I was just saying yes it's exactly that the you know the ancestor of the data protection impact assessment was privacy impact assessment and was just assessing the the, the impact on privacy of individuals the GDPR uh, so the European G General Data Protection Regulation focuses not just on privacy focuses on all fundamental rights and freedoms that are at stake when you process personal data. So exactly what you were saying, any forms of outcomes from data processing, discrimination, manipulation, stigmatization, uh, of course, loss of control of data and invasion of privacy, invasion of home, uh, safety of body, so health, or safety of uh, you know environment and so on and so forth. So yeah, we should have a big approach, and that's why it's difficult to automate the impact assessment because it's so big and so you know diversified that it's difficult to really automate an impact assessment. Before you were you were talking about like a doctor, how there's one possibly more complicated disclosure. Um, you know, in terms of algorithmic decisions, and there may also be a simpler uh, disclosure. Sort of, um, is that what is that sort of what you meant by in your paper by a multi-layered explanation? And do you want to develop that a little bit? <clears throat> yes, exactly. I think multi-layered explanation was. I mean, is again not um, uh, explicit in this way, in the GDPR and in other legislations, but we think that interpreting the GDPR means to have different layers of explanations. Why? Uh, because we can have, uh, um, so explanations can be different considering the moment in which we give the explanation, before that the, decisions is that the decision is taken or afterwards. Mm -hmm. And the moment, the timing is relevant because the, uh, the explanation can be very different if the decision has been already taken, or if you're just explaining the general logic of the algorithm, then you can give, uh, you can consider the audience. The audience of, uh, as I was saying before, um, has also different, uh, different uh, parties. You can have uh, experts, but two kinds of experts, uh, computer science experts. So just other computer scientists that try to adapt an algorithm that has already been built. Then you have experts, sectoral experts, doctors, or other kinds of experts of certain sector, bank, financial experts. So people that decide to use algorithms or that are the first one that uses algorithms. So what in Europe are called users of algorithms. And then uh, you have customers. Even in customers, we could make a difference because there are different level of literacy or data literacy and digital literacy and so on. Of course, explaining something to uh, 
you know, uh, a privacy activist is different from explaining something to a an elderly person or a uh, or a kid. Okay, but yes, audience is relevant. And uh, in general, just looking at the explanation, we can have three layers of explanation, at least three layers. The most general one. Is the general explanation I explain how the algorithm works, and this is not granular. Uh, it's it's very general, right? Uh, um, computer scientists call this explanation global explanation. Uh, this is relevant because it's 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 useful to understand from the outset how the algorithm works, etc. But then um, we have the individual explanation which is why a certain decision was taken on me. Why John Claudio received that explanation, that decision. And it's different from the general one because it's just addressing my own situation. And then uh, it's interesting to notice that there is an intermediate layer. The intermediate layer is the group-based explanation. Group-based explanation means that sometimes similar decisions are taken for similar clusters of people. Uh, similar groups, right? And uh, this might be very useful, more than the individual one. Why? Because I could understand what is my cluster, what is my group. And if I am in a vulnerable group, if I am in a minority group, if uh, the, the, the company is taking uh, uh, advantage on some vulnerabilities that I might have, for example, a group might be very general, black people, or gay people, or also uh, um, fun of some football team, or, you know, it can be very, very specific, and it would be very helpful to enable contestation and the right to say my own opinion in the in the decision. So yes, this should be the three layers at least. Right. And the individual one, that would be probably, I mean, unless it was... Um... I, I I would imagine that the individual one would probably trend toward the group over time, since I I can't imagine that, you know, unless you just insert variables in in you know sort of a template fashion, it's it's certainly not going to be individualized. Um, shifting gears a little bit, what is the <laughs> pro business use case for uh, algorithmic impact assessments? Mm-hmm. Well, um, how could, how do you, do you foresee it actually having a a, a positive business impact for mm-hmm. for enterprises deploying these algorithms? Yeah. yeah, I think I think there might be several positive impacts for businesses um, in uh, performing a, an algorithmic impact assessment. Um, first of all. Uh, enhancing trust of individuals. This is, it seems uh, obvious, but, uh, you know, um, there are now some um, uh, empirical studies on uh, customers. And, uh, for example, uh, just last month, I, um, I was asked to do peer review of one study about this. And usually customers tend to assess, uh, to, 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 to value first the price of some algorithmic systems. Secondly, understandability and, uh, let's say, trustworthiness. And third, for example, impact on the environment, but just at the third level. So uh, uh, the, the, the top two are price and transparency. And of course, this is the benefit of the seller. And when we say the seller, or in generally co- in general companies, of course we are not talking about big big tech because big big tech are so powerful that they don't even need to find uh, you know trust or trustworthiness. Of course they need for for general thing, but you, users users uh, have a lock in effect, right? You wouldn't change from Facebook just because Facebook is not transparent. Yeah, a small group of people would, right? Uh, the same was for Grindr, for example. There was a case um, in Europe against Grindr in which basically uh, the, 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 the court, the Norwegian uh, Data Protection Authority said... That's, you know, they, they are quite monopolist in the field of dating apps for LGBT people, that it would be quite uh, difficult to give freedom to individuals. So apart from these big monopolistic examples, in general, enhancing, trustworth- enhancing trust uh, of uh, individuals is the first benefit. Then there are some other benefits. Um, and the other benefits are that usually 
data controllers, so companies, don't have a clear view of what might be the problems and inaccuracies and problems and gaps and whatever of algorithms, right? So doing an impact assessment, auditing the algorithm might be really beneficial for them to discover some unwanted gaps and problems in the algorithm. And also, our model of uh, algorithmic impact assessment um, implied a big participation of individuals in the process. How? Because we imagine that uh, exercising individual rights could be some necessary steps in the impact assessment mechanism. So basically, if I contest the algorithm, I'm also giving a feedback in the impact assessment loop. So I am giving my personal contribution to the improvement of the algorithm. And of course, it might be considered a naive approach in which we, you know, we all trust each other and so on. But a collaborative uh, model in which the participation of individuals is really guaranteed can be really beneficial for the algorithm itself because many biases of the machines are, you know, undetected and unwanted. It's very it's very rare that company says, yeah, I want to discriminate black people, gay people, disabled people. It might happen. It happened in the past, right? But usually they are, uh, you know, problem of framing, problem of uh, uh, statistical biases and so on. So if you allow people to interact more, to understand, to participate, to sit at the table of the impact assessment through their uh, automated decision-making rights, uh, uh, contestation, explanation, and so on, you would really create an environment of continuous improvement of the algorithm. So, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, a proof of that is that there are already computer scientists of big tech and small tech that are doing that. For example, the IBM uh, lab in New York is already proposing a multi-layered um, explanation system in which individuals can have, uh, you know, uh, they or say. So, yes, I think there are benefits for businesses. And so um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit uh, to connect this to uh, concepts of um, Web 3.0, which I have to define since Web 3.0 means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But basically the notion of people having their own data, like retaining their own data, in a wallet or something that's protected and engaging on decentralized uh, servers where that information isn't necessarily being collected by, you know, like the Googles or just large, you know, even central ISPs. But, you know, basically every, um, you know, every destination in, in, in the Web 3.0, um, it's it's decentralized and it's it's more, um, how should I say, it's, it, there's a different level of interaction, a different level of trust. And certainly if you're in that layer, uh, you know, that could potentially be, uh, you know, a, um, a powerful grounds for building an audience to a particular platform in Web 3.0, where you're, you're saying, I'm not taking your data, but not only that, when I do take your data, here are the conditions upon which I'm going to do it. And this is my, we've done, you know, we're responsible and sort of making that case, you know, to its participants as to how it's processing that data. What are your, what are your thoughts on, on that? <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, this is one, I mean, another complex issue because, uh, of course, um, new forms of, uh, let's say, data governance are, of course, uh, uh, challenging for the uh, traditional structures that we use to protect data, right? Sometimes we might uh, discourage some uh, good technologies or good advancements. Um, in particular, I mean, uh, um, summarizing a bit your question, I mean, rephrasing a bit your question with the question I received in a, in a, um, uh, a conference um, organized by Facebook a few weeks ago. The question was, is, still, uh, is, is there a problem of fairness, even if we decentralize the web, even if we don't own the data? Right. So the problem of can uh, do, do we have a problem of uh, 
fairness and lawfulness and so on, even if data are anonymous and we decentralize systems and so on. And I, I mean, of course, being a privacy activist, my answer would be yes, <laughs> because uh, it's not just that we can, you know, the tension today is to really uh, try to solve with some technologies, some big uh, governance and uh, management problems. But actually, technologies should not be a way to, uh, should not be a passport to, for, you know, like privacy enhancing technologies should not be a passport to for not complying with the law and so on. In particular, just to make some examples, fairness. Hmm? Uh, is still uh, is there still a problem of fairness if we anonymize data, if we create decentralized, uh, decentralized systems? Yes, if we have an impact-based approach, as we were saying before. If we focus just on the impact on individuals, we can have adverse impacts even in in a Web 3.0 scenario, because I can manipulate people even without knowing who they are. I can distort consumers' behaviors, even if we really don't have ideas on who is uh, uh, male, female, gay, lesbian, and so on. So basically uh the the point is that it's it's wonderful to have an ex ante approach and to have a justification of the algorithm ex ante so from the beginning but it's also important to have a um periodical ex post um you know, analysis of what's happening on individuals and trying to protect them. And yeah, of course, there might be an accusation of being paternalistic and European usually have this, uh, you know, kinds of accusation in particular from US, etc. But I think it's not paternalism. It's looking at individuals as powerless players in the, in the market and trying to look not at these technologies as a way to be free from other burdens. These technologies, so the web 3.0 and so on, is important, but we should still take care of the effects. Manipulations. Uh, and I mean, we have many examples from Cambridge Analytica to, uh, uh, to the Facebook papers and so on. So, you know. Right. And it, it sounds like what you're saying is that um you know, whether it's web two or web three, the same issue arises, which is, you know, there's still a collection of activity or information or generalization. You don't necessarily even need to know the identity of people. It's very easy to de-anonymize or even, um, or even make uh, very particular uh, algorithmic assessments of the actions of people who meet certain characteristics without even identifying who they are um and it's, it sounds to me like like what you're saying is and, and i agree with the well, <laughs> i'll first let you say it before i agree with it but um uh you know that that the notion of of whether of a decentralized server or a centralized you know facebook or or google taking that data and and running it through algorithms and and you know making you know engaging in activities that may impact the the user is is similar or or even potentially the risks could be even identical yeah yeah exactly i mean um not identical uh but yes for 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 the impacts on individuals uh, of course it might be uh, dangerous to think that the decentralized uh, platform might be the solution. The centralized platforms are, of course, uh, you know, interesting because they help data minimization. So data necessity, I just collect very limited amount of data. But at the same time, we are in a uh, in an age where big tech have so powerful uh, anal- big data analytics and machine learning models that they really don't need my information, right? Um, you know, they, they really um, don't need to know uh, my name and so on, right? So basically, I think that the point today is to uh, protect, um, um, you know, in, in a wide way, individuals, not just their data in a, you know, 90s uh, way in a way approach, right? 
So yes, I, I think uh, I think it's uh, it's important. Also, it it would be dangerous to to have a limited view in which decentralizing systems means that these data are not considered personal data because you cannot identify individuals. And so you escape from the GDPR. And escaping from the GDPR doesn't mean just escaping from individual rights. It also means escaping from the fairness principle impact assessments you know and it's so it, it 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 would be really a way to say we do this so we don't have to respect other laws and of course it's not acceptable and this is why i think it's good to have ai based legislation it's not just a personal data based legislation and that's why many countries in the world even european union are going towards artificial intelligence act not looking at personal data alone but looking at any form of interaction between humans and AI, but maybe this is another topic. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll touch on that. <laughs> um, with regards to, and, and maybe this also equally applies to AI, but um, you know, do you see a, a potential risk of the outcomes of, of these assessments becoming, um, you know, becoming politicized or becoming effectively a policy decision? Let's just say that a business was forced to prove a negative to the regulators, prove to, you know, in your impact assessment, you need to come to the conclusion that you are not discriminating. You need to prove the, these negatives. You need to prove that you're not. Um, and it may be difficult. Sometimes I, I know when I used to work with developers and it was always a, a barrier as a lawyer with developers, you'd say, you know, you need to prove to me that you don't do this. And they're like, well, by definition, I don't do this because it's not programmed into the system. I'm like, no, 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 no. You still were regulated. You have to prove the negative, but in, but do you see proving the negative um, potentially as 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 forcing policy decisions that even weren't um, necessarily overt? Hmm. Well, this is a really interesting challenge because basically, uh, my definition of uh, algorithmic justification was exactly proving the negative, so proving uh, why and how uh, the algorithm is not discriminatory, is not manipulative, is not stigmatizing, unfair, inaccurate, and so on. And of course, in legal terms, uh, negative proofs are quite uh, impossible, you know? Uh, in Latin, I mean, I'm Italian, I like to use Latin when I do law, and uh, in Latin we say probatio diabolica. So it's the, the devil uh, proof. But uh, we should be pragmatical. And, we sh and I think it's important that regulators, like the, you know, in Europe we have data protection authorities, in the US you have many authorities, including Federal Trade Commission and so on, should give some clear guidelines on how to deal with these negative proofs to avoid some political, you know, uh, or uh, some distortion of the existing or the future proposals. So basically, if you um of course it's it's difficult to to, to prove that you are not discriminatory, but you could prove what are the reasonable steps that you took in order to avoid to be discriminatory. And these reasonable steps should be persuasive enough to uh, convince the data protection authority or the FTC or, you know, regulators in general that you were right and that you are taking this problem seriously in serious account. Okay. So I really think that, of course, uh, it would be impossible to guarantee that you are 100% free from uh, discrimination. But that's why we need a risk-based approach. Discrimination is a risk. The risk-based approach is not that you delete the risk, it's that you mitigate the risk. So, you know, the two components of risks are likelihood and impact, severity. And you can, uh, uh, you can play on one of the two or on both of these levels. You can say, we made discrimination less likely. To, 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 to occur. Or you, we made the severity of discrimination less likely. Why? Because, for example, we didn't, we decided not to process sensitive data so that discrimination could be not on, I don't know, gender, sexual orientation, and so on. So, you know, um, 
I, I think this is important. And uh, we have some, uh, in a, I mean, uh, I had a really like a positivist approach just a few seconds ago saying that we should have uh, regulators to give guidelines. Also, bottom-up approaches, codes of conduct, um, certification mechanism, you know, all these forms of bottom-up uh, compliance forms could be helpful. Because if, for example, all... Uh, uh, cloud service providers or all banks decide that uh, reasonable steps in order to prove to be not discriminatory are one, two, three, and four, it would be easier to avoid uh, you know, this distortion and uh, uh, circumvention of um, existing or future requirements. Yes. But of course, this is a very, very big issue. And uh, yeah, we will see in the future. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, and so what about uh, after you've created the um, uh, algorithmic impact assessment, um, you know, are you envisioning like full publication? I know we talked about trade secrets may not make that feasible, but but how do you view, uh, you know, good practices or ideal practices around the publication of those assessments versus a summary or something uh, more tailored to disclosure? Yeah. Well, um, I, I don't think that a full publication of impact assessment might be uh, beneficial because in that case, there's the risk that companies could have a really limited approach to impact assessment. If they know that they have to disclose everything, probably they would not take this um, task seriously or they will have a very limited yeah, approach. It could be a litigation risk as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, but what companies should understand is that the report could say we 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 saw this problem and we mitigated it, and this is a form of justification. This is a form of negative proof that, as we were saying just one minute ago, so basically, it would be wonderful to have a clear view of the risks that they saw coming and the mitigations that they proposed. Why? Because if they don't even see risks, well, then the regulator and also individuals could see, guys, you, you are social media. You didn't see that discrimination is a problem. Uh, of course, you might say that you have mitigation for it, but of course it's a problem, right? Uh, I, I can make some a personal, uh, <laughs> you know, experience from that. Um, I, as, as you, as you saw, as you said at the beginning, I am also expert um, um, assessor of a European Union proposals, research proposal, ethics expert, and basically what we do is to do a risk assessment. We see whether. I know how uh, some proposals, some research proposals uh, for European Union funded projects can have high risks for fundamental rights and freedoms, right? And uh, and we see the self assessment of individuals, and when we see of uh, companies, sorry, companies, uh, universities, whoever wants to apply for a grant, and uh, it's much better to see the risk written on the paper, say, yes, we see that there are big risks here with some explanation on why you treat the risks, uh, compared to other people that say, no, no, we see no risk because we are perfect. So I think it's much more uh, you know, um, persuasive to see a, a, a big risks on the table, but addressed rather than uh, a perfect world in which everything is okay. Yeah, right? So. I think it's quite obvious, but companies sometimes tend to have the second approach. <laughs> right. Because it's more protective and it's a uh, yeah. rubber stamp, but I, I get you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, so let's say that um, uh, I'm a company and I want to do an algorithmic impact assessment today, and but I don't have any experience in doing it. Where, what resources are available? Well, <clears throat> We have um, not many existing resources available. Um, it depends on uh, what is your company. And so what are the level of risks that you have for your data? Of course, I think that, uh, as I was saying before, the Canadian software for algorithmic impact assessment is a good proxy. 
I know it's just for public entities in Canada, but it can be, it's, it's open source. You can go on the website and do it. And so why not applying yep. this also to private companies all around the world? This is, this, this is better than nothing, right? Then we have another tool uh, that is the, it's called PIA. It's the Privacy Impact Assessment Tool of the CNIL, the French Data Protection Authority. They have uh, something similar to the uh, Canadian algorithm, but it's, I mean, it's good for small and medium enterprises, or let's say for small enterprises, but it's not, in my view, appropriate for high-risk, uh, big uh, companies. Why? Because it, it has a very superficial approach. The approach in that case is just based on uh, uh, cybersecurity risks, which is not the risk that we were uh, addressing now. Of course, cybersecurity is, is important, but uh, now we are talking about new kinds of security. We call we, we are talking about cognitive security. So the uh, blocking the company from entering in my mind and and manipulating my behaviors, or discrimination and so on. So yes, there are some not not many tools actually. Uh, we were trying to develop uh, a project about uh, automating uh, impact assessment, but it was not easy because uh, we were waiting for new legislative proposals to have a very, you know, like um, um, wide approach, comprehensive approach. So we will see. But uh, yes, I think uh, it would it would not be easy for for small companies to start. Yes, this is a problem, of course. Yeah. And 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 to your knowledge, um, are there big companies that are uh, social media companies, perhaps that are trying to tackle this? Mm -hmm. Well, um, yes. I mean, there are uh, forms of innovative impact assessments that um, are being uh, performed. I was mentioning um, IBM. Um, um, of course, not the whole system, but some, some particular um, parts of the algorithmic impact assessment proposal were uh, applied. Uh, for example, I was mentioning participatory approach. So participation of individuals in the loop, right? And we know that Twitter, for example, has taken some steps in this direction, in the direction of making participation uh, of uh, users of uh, representatives of vulnerable people in the loop. So this was already, you know, something. Um, so, yeah, th and there are some um, um, privacy associations that are trying to propose some uh, models. For example, Algorithmic Justice League was also proposing uh, some uh, forms of participation in the impact assessment and so on. Um, I, I think one company that for sure will need and will take some steps in the direction of algorithmic impact assessment and the better impact assessment is exactly is Facebook or Meta, because basically the Facebook papers showed quite clearly that they they have a problem in uh, addressing risks. They know risk, they can recognize risks coming, but they they were not able to prove to give the negative proof to saying we care about teenagers having problems on Instagram, we care about misinformation, we care about distortion of behaviors of kids. Right. So I think that the impact assessment and justification model, um, algorithmic impact assessment could be really useful for Facebook in the next uh, months. And uh, I have some, you know, I, I've been talking with them and probably they will take some steps in this direction. No, yeah, great. Uh, they, they could probably use it from a publicity perspective. Um, before yeah, we, uh, sh you know, shifting gears out of the um, uh, away from the algorithmic assessment, uh, there have been some other developments in GDPR, which I know you're quite knowledgeable on, uh, one of which is the platform workers proposal, uh, which also goes to the use of algorithms. But but what platform workers um you know, need to know about it, uh, protection of, you know, and also protections related to the presumption that they're employees and not just uh, independent contractors. Do you want to um, develop a little bit on that? Yeah, sure. I think uh, so. 
platform work directive uh, was proposed just a few weeks ago. Uh, it was proposed at the end of November. Uh, I know, actually, it was the beginning of December. And uh, yes, it's a uh, it's great uh, innovation that complement a bit data protection rules. Basically, um, yes, uh, I mean, I know that in this, post- in this podcast you have already addressed the notion of cooperatives and uh, gig economy and so on. The European Union approach to gig economy and platform workers and so on, for what concerns algorithms, so I will just address this now because we wouldn't have time to address the whole proposal, but just for what concerns algorithm is that workers should be aware of the logic of the algorithm, the requirements that the algorithm uses. So the data, the kind of categories of data that the algorithm uses, and this is the transparency part, but it was a bit read in the, in the GDPR. What I, what I really care about is uh, another provision, which is consultation and participation of workers in decisions about uh, the adoption of automated decision-making systems. So it's the participatory approach I was mentioning before. Finally, clearly, in the letter of the law, we have, we will have, if it will be approved, when it will be approved, trade unions and workers will be asked to uh, give their opinion. And so in the assessment of the of the automated decision before that it is uh, adopted. And I think it might be very interesting because I think workers wouldn't change their mind if they understand that the algorithm, uh, Deliveroo algorithm, or I don't know, um, Just Eat algorithm, uh, takes some data or others. Of course, it would be better because it could you could control if there are some discriminations. And we know that, for example, there was a scandal with Glovo and other. So we know that there are a lot of news uh, and you know about uh, algorithms used by uh, platforms. But what is interesting is that workers are asked for their opinion. And this could, because we don't need to take, I think, algorithms for a yes or no choice. There might be a yes choice with some safeguards. So yes, we don't need to open the black box, but we can put close to the black box some protections in the business model. Not in the algorithm, in the business model. And I think this is the next steps, going beyond the, ch- the challenge to open the black box and mitigate the effects of the black box. Maybe that's what the platform directive is trying to do. Platform work, sorry. Great. Well, something we'll, we'll have to explore in, in future uh, in, in future episodes. Um, and yeah. also, I wanted to touch on, before I, I let you go, on the AI Act uh, as well, yeah. which you've also written about. I think you wrote an op-ed in New York Times and maybe some other uh, other places as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. My co-author uh, was uh, Professor Frank Pasquale, who was the one who invented the black box uh, concept applied to algorithms and law. And uh, yes, we um, the AI Act, the Artificial Intelligence Act, proposed uh, last April uh, by the European Commission. Now it's under discussion with the Brussels Privacy Hub. We are trying to uh, inform about the discussion of different policymakers, the Parliament, the Council, and so on. Will be approved probably in the spring 2023. So not now, uh, but the discussion is at a good level. Uh, basically, it's uh, a risk based approach again uh, in which uh, uh, algorithm users and developers and users are not customers users are companies that use algorithms will be asked to take some design duty steps in order to mitigate the risks of algorithms and there is a clear list of mitigations from transparency to human oversight, to data management plan, to check inaccuracies of input of algorithms, inaccuracies of outputs, contextualization, and so on. Then there is a list of forbidden practices, the blacklist. And this is something I think it should have an international approach. Social scoring, like the, the, the Chinese examples of uh, some years ago, uh, social scoring was, uh, was an example of um, um, uh, blacklist practice in the uh, in the list of the EU AI Act, um, be, uh, subliminal uh, techniques, 
leading to mental manipulation, leading to physical or psychological damages, uh, manipulation, exploiting uh, uh, vulnerabilities based on age, disability, and economic and social conditions, uh, or um, uh, indiscriminate uh, facial recognition by police and law enforcement authorities. So you see, this is a blacklist uh, list, and then we have uh, some, uh, um, you know, um, other forms of AI. Um, so non-risky AI that uh, are free to, um, to to be commercialized, etc. But they can adopt some codes of conduct. Uh, of course, it's not perfect. There are some problems. For example, in my view, emotion recognition should be considered high risk. At the moment, it's considered limited risk. But of course, emotion recognition is something that really touches our privacy, our, you know. Um, and uh, the, the similar things might be, say, for manipulation. At the moment, the only form of prohibited manipulation is manipulation leading to physical or psychological damages. What about economic damages? So, yes, it's, of course, uh, there are room for improvement, but I think it's one of the most advanced legislation in the world. And in the op-ed in the New York Times, we were suggesting that the U.S. should take inspirations from the European Union proposal. Uh, in the U.S. now, there is the, bill, the proposal for this bill of AI, but the bill should be uh, soft law. And so we really hope that there will be some hard law approach on uh, AI, or even in the U.S. Yeah, well, um, certainly th that's a developing story as well. Uh, too much to, to touch on at, at this point in the podcast, but thank you for the, the summary. It was great to have you on and uh, to learn uh, about um, about the uh, algorithmic impact assessment and, and start to figure out how it, how it actually applies or, or could apply. So thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. It was my pleasure. Thank you.